Good morning. Good morning. You know, today I'm going to make things just a little awkward. Yes, stand up. Turn around and face that way. You guys, can you stand up? Turn around and face that way. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I want you guys to look at all of those that are sitting down. Mm -hmm. And those of you that are standing, you, you that are sitting down, I want you to look those standing up. <laughs> See, it's awkward, isn't it? isn't it? Okay, you guys can go ahead and sit down. Now you guys stand up. And you guys stand up. Turn around so they can see you. You guys, this three, right here, stand up, turn around. Yep, you guys can stand up, stand up. Turn around, turn around so everybody can see you. Okay, go ahead and sit down. I'm going to ask you two a huge favor. You guys got to come around this way so they can see you. At least over here by the credenza. In this row, would you go ahead and stand up? You guys go ahead and stand up. And now we're kind of getting to that awkward stage where there's kind of half behind you and half in front of you. So, so kind of turn around this way as well so these people can get a good look at you. Okay, you can go ahead and sit down. You guys stand up. Turn around, make sure everybody gets a good look at you. You got to be looking, that's the whole point. You got to be looking. Okay. Go ahead and sit down. You guys can stand up. I already got you, didn't I? You did. You, <laughs> you guys go ahead and stand up. <laughs> turn around. There's a lot more in front of you, so turn that way too. They all got to get a good look at you. Okay, go ahead and sit down. Back row. Back row. Back row doesn't have to turn around. <laughs> Okay, go ahead and sit down. Do you want to do it again? <laughs> what did you see? My family. <laughs> Children. Children. The church. The church. Yes, all very appropriate, correct answers, but not the one I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, a little more than that. Disciples. Yes. Well, hopefully. Hopefully. God's creation. Yes. Family. The body. What is that? Oh. Family. That? Body. The body. The body of what? Christ. Christ. The body of Christ. God is very specific, very purposeful in everything that He does. <clears throat> he doesn't do things by mistake. Nothing sneaks by Him. Everything has a point and a purpose. And for whatever reason, in God's thinking, in God's decision to do things, He has brought this group of individuals together to form the body of Christ. That should give you a very good feeling knowing that God has called you to a specific time, place, and position. The body of Christ knit together, woven together. It doesn't begin here and it doesn't end here. Because God has worked together the body of Christ all over this globe. And He's continuing to build it. And He's continuing to put together. We have 
uh, other parts of the body of Christ that are meeting just catty corner of the church over here. Some more that are meeting over here. We have some that are meeting in houses around Stevensville and other churches up and down the valley. God is very specific in what He does. Now sometimes we know the why. Do you know why He formed the body of Christ? Why? Why did God put the body of Christ together? Change the world. What's that? Change the world. To change the world. Well, kind of. Share His gospel. Share His gospel. Yeah. Glorify Him. Yeah. Different gifts and talents. Because people need support, they can't do it by themselves. Thank you, Rob. Oh, yeah. If you have your Bible, open up to First Corinthians. This is not my message for today, but I think perhaps it will be. First Corinthians chapter twelve. It's on page one thousand two hundred and nineteen. <laughs> So what did I have for breakfast? I think Terry wants to stand up all by herself. First Corinthians 12. I'm going to pick up in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. I want to back up because there's one verse that just jumps out at me. Look at verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as He chose. God has chosen you. God, in His infinite wisdom and His incredible mercy, has chosen you. And He has put you in a unique place within His body to function. Now notice, when Paul is going through, he, he gives two kind of opposite ideas for people that, that don't or, or, or think they're not part of the body. 
Uh, back up here uh, in verse 15, he says, If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the eye should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, uh, that would not make it any less a part of the body. <clears throat> See, there, there are those that I have come across in life that for whatever reason feel that they are unworthy. <clears throat> they just they can't accept God's grace. They don't, they don't really understand. None of us are worthy. That's what makes it grace. That's what makes it amazing grace because we don't deserve it and yet God gives it anyway. See, none of us are saved because we deserve to be saved. We're all undeserving. If any of us deserved to be saved, there would be no need of the cross. So, on the one hand, we have this group of people that, that just, they don't feel like they can ever receive God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy. My grandfather was one of them. Uh, laying in his deathbed, he was dying of cancer. And my brother had a chance to witness to him and talk with him and and his whole life, he just felt like God would never want him because of the things that he had done. And he's lying in his deathbed, and we know the time is coming. And, and my brother was just sharing with him, and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm just too afraid. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But you need to remember that perfect love casts out fear. And God is perfect love. And so my brother got a chance to witness to my grandfather. And a couple days later, they were talking, and my grandfather accepted the Lord. Amen. And it was an amazing thing because this man who trembled when he thought of his impending death had peace. And he had something to look forward to instead of something to dread. <clears throat> But he had this idea, and I've known several people, almost all of them men, not all of them, but, but most of them men, who just feel like God will not accept them because of the things that they have done. And yet it says that all sin was imputed to Jesus, was laid on his shoulders. It was all given to him. None of it was, well, oh, that's too bad. He, he's not going to take that. It was all laid on him at the cross. But then there's another group of people. And this one is actually very predominant. This is the one you will see most often. We look down to verse 21. It says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. <coughs> Folks, when you come into Christ, you are knit into his body. And you do not get the privilege, the right to say, I don't need a church. I don't need a church home. I don't need a family. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about people who have church in their home. Okay, that's, that's a different thing. I'm talking about those that just don't attend church. They don't, they don't need church. That's, that's not what Scripture tells us, folks. Scripture tells us we need each other. And it's not even telling us so much that you need a pastor to teach you or, or a body of elders to lead you. It's saying we need one another. In the economy of the church, God has ordained for His own purposes that there is an order. As a matter of fact, you read a little bit further down and you see some of the order that God has placed in the church. Okay? So, so church is not chaotic. As a matter of fact, a little bit later in this, this epistle, Paul goes on to say that God is not a God of chaos. He is a God of order. Okay? But we cannot say to one another, I don't need you. Now sometimes we don't see what we need each other for. But that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that we're blind. It means that we can't see. Sometimes, 
for whatever reason, at the various points in our lives, we may not be fulfilling our role in the church. We may not be doing those things that God has called us to in the church. But that doesn't mean you can reject the church. It, you are still a vital part of the church. See, when I had you stand up and look, I wanted you to look at the body of Christ. And when you're praying, I want you to picture these people around you. And I want you to cover them in prayer. I want you to get to know the people in this fellowship so that you know how to pray. I want you to be transparent so people know how to pray for you. See, none of us has it all together. Well, Laz does. He's manipulating everyone. <laughs> we all have deficiencies. We all have areas of weakness that we need. Folks, we need to, you've got to get this word into your head. We need one another. We don't like that idea. I mean, we're Americans, by golly. Not only are we Americans, we're Montanans. We don't need anybody. My dog and my rifle and I'm good. That's not what God says. That's not what God says. See, God has chosen you. And He has put you into place to fulfill not your purposes, not my purposes, but to fulfill His purposes. To do those things that He has appointed you to do. Remember in Ephesians chapter 2? Flip over there with me if you would. Ephesians chapter 2. This is, this is I, I quote this passage a lot. Because this is uh, talking about salvation. This is where we get our formula for salvation. For God, we, actually, we don't get it. We, we, it's revealed to us. Okay, so starting in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I'm going to pause there for a minute. Grace plus faith equals salvation. That's it. Chapter 2. Grace plus faith equals salvation. Okay? And then we have this, this phrase here. It says not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, you, you can do nothing to earn salvation. Your greatest acts done out of the will of God, out of the blood of the cross, are for naught, because they don't merit you anything before God. But then there's this, this next verse that comes here. Because the, the, the formula doesn't end at grace plus faith equals salvation because there's something else, isn't there? Not unto salvation. Grace plus faith, that's all that's required unto salvation. But then there's a result that comes out of the salvation. And that's in verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you come to Christ, hmm, boy, this is, let, let me, let, I'm going to have to explain this after I say it. When you come to Christ, you have not arrived. Well, yes, you have. But really, yes, you have. Because see, when you come to Christ, salvation is yours. Okay? You have done nothing to earn it. You can do nothing to keep it. It's a direct result of God's grace. Okay, that's, that's just the way it is. Alright? 
Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people walking around claiming to be saved that are not saved. Scripture tells us that many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? And he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Okay? There's a lot of people that think they have salvation. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. Okay? Because, see, salvation is, is, is all about relationship. It's all about putting into a right order a relationship. Your relationship with God. That's, that's what it's all about. Okay? Because sin, sin breaks that order. Sin makes it such that we are our own gods. And we pursue other gods. But salvation puts us in that right order where there is one true God and we are not Him. <clears throat> Boy, I, I think sometimes America needs to learn that lesson. We are not God. Okay? But see here, when you come to salvation... That's like the start. Because that's when you run the race, man. You take off. Go. Everything beforehand was you just getting ready for the race. When you come to salvation, your feet are on the blocks, boom, you're gone. And you're pressing on to the prize. And you're running so that you might win the prize. Letting nothing get in the way. Letting nothing get in the way. See, this is the root of what I want to share with you today. We are the body of Christ. And yet, are we doing those things that God has called us to do? Are we running the race that has been laid out before us? Or are we stopping along the way to smell the flowers and take autographs? Do we pause periodically at the water table to congratulate each other on how well we're running and forget that the race is not done? Do we allow the things of this life to distract us from the eternal things? Are we exchanging the eternal for the temporal? Because see, there are things, verse 10, for we are His workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What has God called you to do? What is God calling you to do? Do you know? Well, there are, there are some things, yeah, definitely. Great commission. Go. Go and preach. But, but what is he speaking specifically to you? Because we all have very different walks in Christ. What is God calling you to do in his body? I speak... First here, and then there. Because there are some that are called to be evangelists, that are to, to, to be the mouth of God. They are gifted with evangelism, where they are going out and they are speaking forth into a lost and dying world. But there are many gifts in the body of Christ. There are many callings in the body of Christ. And, and those that serve in one way are not to be given more esteem than those that serve in another. See, don't we like to celebrate the big mouths? Look at look in the body of Christ. Look at the people that see receive the applaud. Those are the people that are talking. They're the, those are the showmen. And I, I don't, let me rephrase. I'm not saying that they are trying to be showmen, but they are being received as showmen. Okay? I'm not calling into question these men's motives. What I'm calling into question is how they're received. It scares me sometimes. I, I think of Keith Green and uh, one of the things that he said before he died. He said that uh, I am an evangelist. I am a servant of God. Music is a tool which God has given me to reach the people. Amen. If God should present to me a better tool to reach the people, I will no longer need music. Okay? 
What is God calling you to do? In the body of Christ, you might be an ear. Are you listening? You might be a foot. Are you walking? Are you doing that which God has called you to do? Now, let me, let me add a caveat here. This is not a sermon about being busy for busyness' sake. This is a message about striving to do the will of God. To accomplishing those things that He has prepared for us to do. We can all get busy. I mean, those people that called out to Him, Lord, Lord, did we not? They were doing all kinds of incredible things. You and I would not be able to look at them and go, huh, he ain't making it. As a matter of fact, you and I would probably look at them and applaud them because of the great things they're doing for God in the name of God. And yet on that day, Jesus is going to tell them, I, I, I don't know you. I've never known you. Who are you? Depart from me. In the church, in the body, we are called to fill a role. A specific role. I don't know what God has called. Some of you I know what God has called you to do. I, I, I know very clearly what God has called some of you to do. Some of you are doing it. Some of you aren't. Some of you have yet to embrace those things that God has called you to do. Now I'm warning you now. I'm praying for you. <laughs> Man, I'm praying God's will all over you. But some of you, God has revealed to me your role, your place, your purpose. I, I, I think maybe some of you aren't really even sure yourselves what your, your purpose is, what your role is, what part of the body you are to function as. Homework. I love giving homework. <laughs> when I was in college, I had a professor that believe that for every hour you spent in the class, you should spend three hours doing work on your own. One semester I had him for nine college hours. <laughs> oh. I want you this week to picture in your mind those people that stood up and looked at you. And I want you to be praying. I want you to pray specifically that God would reveal to them how He wants to use them. And that He would then give them the courage to do what He has called them to do. That He would cause His will to be done in their lives. Not just, uh, God's sovereign. Man, when He wants something done, His Word tells us it's going to get done. Pray that maybe He would make them willing to be a part of His will. To do those things that He's calling them to do. To embrace those things that he's calling to do. I honestly, I believe in the church. We're going to be sending out more missionaries. I believe that God has called the church universal to send people out. But I believe that God has called people in this church to go out. We've seen the, the McDaniels and the, the Kidders. God has called and sent them out to go minister in other places. I believe God's, God's going to do that with more people in this church. I pray for that. That, see, that's where I want to see the growth of this church to be. Not in this building. I, I want it to be in the kingdom. And I want, I want the message to go out to people all over this world. Well, I wish I could just assign people. God doesn't, God doesn't let me do that. Yes, He does. So I want you this week, I want you to be in prayer. And, I, and, and I don't even take, you know, in your prayer time, don't, don't take a large amount of time and start going, okay, who was sitting in this chair? And who was sitting in this chair? Like, do as Paul says. He says, upon every remembrance of you, I pray. <coughs> Whenever God brings you to my mind, I pray. So as you're going down, down the road, you're, you're driving behind that tractor that for whatever reason drives in front of me on east side. That dude sits every day waiting for me. <laughs> and sometimes he's in a car. When you're driving, you know, 40 miles an hour in a 65 zone, and you have extra time, as God brings to your remembrance these people, start praying for them. 
Start lifting them up. Maybe <gasps> give them a call. Just let them know you're praying. See if there's anything specific you can pray for. Everybody has a story. Everybody has things going on. Everybody has something in life that they would like prayer for. Mm, sometimes people are a little embarrassed to ask for prayer, to, to say what they would like prayer for. Sometimes they're not really even sure. Hey, life is going pretty good right now. Well, pray that you realize that even in the good times you need God. That's what Paul says. Whether I'm a, a based or a bound. So homework. Now the second part of your homework, part two. As you're praying, I want you to pray to see how God would use you. And I, I don't want you to uh, get this idea, because some of us have this concrete idea, I'm in the niche that I'm supposed to be. This is where I'm supposed to be. Okay. See if God would take you out of your niche. See if God would take you out of that safe place. See if God would put you in a place that, that is outside your comfort zone. I, I, I marvel at the Apostle Paul. I marvel at him. Because here's a man, I mean, that, that went from city to city proclaiming Jesus Christ. And, and I, I mean, getting stoned, getting scourged, beaten with rods, run out of town. And yet, look how often in his epistles he says, pray for me that I might have the boldness to preach as I should, to testify as I should, to say those things that I should. Think of me. Why do you need boldness? Well, he, he, knows himself, he knows himself better than we do, doesn't he? Pray for me. Pray that I would have boldness. Pray that I would be willing to say those things to the people that I need to say. But, but also pray that I would do so in love. I find it really easy to talk to people when I'm mad. I'll tell you all about you. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's not speaking the truth in love, is it? <clears throat> so pray for those around you. and Pray for yourself. Pray how God would use you. Be willing to be used. See how he would use you. And my message today is on discipleship, and we're not, we're not actually going to get to it because there are a number of things that I want to do today. Uh, there's a number of people that uh, I'm going to ask to come and talk with you. Um, but I want you to take this week, I want you to kind of get uh, take a look at discipleship. I told you a couple weeks ago when we started the series that Jesus was unique in the way that he called his disciples. He was unique as a rabbi. You know, most rabbis, they had the students brought to them. And, and the parents and the student would, would plead their case as to why this, this student should be allowed to, to learn under this rabbi. Jesus didn't do that, did he? But he went out and he picked them. Can you imagine what James and John's dad thought? Out on the fishing boats with his boys, fishing and working with fishing stuff, nets and boats and... Jesus comes by on the shore and says, come follow me. And they ditch Dad. <laughs> I mean, you got to wonder what Dad was thinking. But Jesus went out and he called people to come follow him. Jesus is still calling people to come follow him. He is still calling disciples. And he calls us by name. I like the story of Nathaniel and Philip. Nathaniel goes and he tells Philip, hey, look, we found the Messiah. Come and meet him. And, and, and Nathaniel brings Philip. And Jesus says, well, yeah, I know who you are. I saw you the other day. You were standing under the tree when I was teaching. And Philip's just like, oh, you know me? Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. Greater things than this you will see. I just, I love the fact that, that Jesus knew right what Nathaniel needed. So next week, God willing, <coughs> we're going to talk about discipleship. We're going to take a look at the, those components that make up discipleship. Okay? So, Father, I thank you. 
I thank you, God, that you have put this body together. Father, that you are carefully knitting together every component, every piece. I thank you, God, that your word says there is one body. that we are baptized into one spirit. I ask, Lord God, that you would open our, our, our eyes, open our hearts, that we would see, that we would embrace how you have called us to serve the body of Christ. What role you would ask us to fulfill. I ask, Lord God, that you would give us the boldness to go outside of those things that we are comfortable with. To embrace those things that you desire of us. Father, that you would give us the courage to go where you would send us. To speak as you would tell us. Father, to love as you have loved us. I thank you, Father, that you have not set us on this road to walk alone. Because, Father, not only have you given us brothers and sisters in Christ, but you have sent your Spirit. And you have said you would never leave us. You would never forsake us. We bless you today, Father. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.